Paul Hager. Good evening, parents and fellow students. Sadly, I'm nowhere near as clever as Tushar and Judy, so I'm left with a bit of more of a boring speech, but I hope you'll still enjoy it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you today. I'd like to quickly start off by thanking Dr. Simmons for the intro and for being so lenient and helpful in my college admissions process the past couple of weeks, along with the entire Ruskin Counseling Department, especially Mr. Brown and Mrs. McNett. The extra work you put in and patience you exhibited really will go far in my application process to Germany, and I thank you dearly. Along with that, I would like to take a brief moment to extend my thanks to my family and teachers. You really have made me into what I am today. I would also like to briefly acknowledge David Foster Wallace for providing the inspiration for this speech. Now, I know graduation speeches are supposed to reminisce about our last four years at high school and how we've done so many fantastic things. I'm supposed to make you all excited for the next chapter of your lives and assure you that the next four years are going to be even better. And while that may turn out to be true for some of you, there's absolutely no way I can guarantee that for all of you. And in the end, I honestly don't believe that a five minute speech given by a guy you've seen in the hallway a grand total of 20 times in your entire life will actually change the way you think about things, but I feel like I have to try. The only experience I have to draw from is one of empathy. And I hope by the time I'm done, I will at least have illuminated some train of thought that's always been in the back corner of your mind, but that you've never fully realized. I'd like to tell you our brief story. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way. He nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the heck is water? Now, I know I feel like this is a standard requirement of U.S. commencement speeches, like a didactic little parable-ish story. And if you're worried that I plan to present myself here as the wise older fish explaining what water is to you younger fish, don't be. I am not a wise old fish. The point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are the hardest to see and talk about. What I hope you will all realize by the end of this, and what I pulled from that story, is that life is all about perception. Take, for example, a quick trip to the grocery store. You're fed up because it's been a long week of tests and you've realized you just ran out of ramen and Gatorade, and your roommate isn't home because he's out making bad life choices again, and really, all you want to do is go to sleep. But you force yourself out of the room and walk to the nearest grocery store. Along your walk, you meet countless irritating people that just won't get out of the way. And one of them even runs into you, causing your blood pressure to spike to dangerous levels. And in the store, it seems like every single moron in town has congregated and decided to stand in your grocery line at the exact same time. You look around you, you sneer at the old lady in front, desperately trying to get one more coupon to work. You look with disgust upon the teenage girl in front of you, jumping up and down and almost screaming for joy into her phone. You wish everybody would just go away. If you choose to think this way in a store and in life, fine. Lots of us do. Except thinking this way tends to be so easy and automatic that it usually doesn't end up being a choice. It is your natural default setting. It is the automatic way that you experience the boring, frustrating, crowded parts of life when you're operating on the automatic, unconscious belief that you are the center of the world and that your immediate needs and feelings are what should determine the world's priorities. There is another way to think of the world around you, though, and it all comes down to choice. The biggest gift of education is that it has taught you to think so that you may choose. So that you may choose to believe that maybe the guy that just ran into you on the way to the store was actually late for a crucial exam, that if he missed, he would fail out of college and be forced to work at a miserable, low-paying job for the rest of his life because his family can no longer afford to send him to another college. You can choose to think that the old lady desperately trying to get one more coupon to work is actually so depressed and poor since her husband is dying of cancer that she struggles to get through each day. And basic interactions like buying groceries almost bring her to tears and cause her to shut down. You can choose to think that the teenage girl jumping up and down in obnoxious adulation in front of you just got a phone call that her brother just got out of the hospital and his heart surgery was a complete success. These are all things you can choose to believe. I know they are extremely unlikely, but they are not impossible. This, I submit, is the freedom of a real education, of learning how to be well-adjusted. You 
who get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. I have a quote by Charles Swindle that I think summarizes this perfectly. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearances, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that some people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. What I believe Swindle is saying, and what I agree with wholeheartedly, is that we're not helpless victims of our lives and our reality, but we have the freedom to make conscious choices about how we perceive, interpret, and respond to everything around us. I'm saying that we're so busy trying to run away from the reality we feel we can't escape from, that we fail to consider that this reality is our escape. It's up to us to decide how we feel and react. We are not victims of the world, but victims of ourselves and how we think and act. But we can also be champions in that very same environment, just by choosing to think of it differently. Happiness stems from how we react to what happens around us, not how much money we make. Although I must digress and say I've never seen anyone in a Ferrari with a frown on their face. <laughs> I also acknowledge that this is very difficult and we will often fail at it. I know I have multiple times. It's hard to undo years and years of conditioning, of imitating what we've learned from each other. But we can do it. And if we really, really try and practice, we will be better at it. If nothing else, just the effort will make us more mindful and that is its own small victory. So keep reminding yourself, this is water, this is water. Thank you, and I wish you way more than luck. Also, their names will be permanently inscribed on a plaque that will remain in the school. Congratulations. 